we continue to make our way through the book of Revelation um, and we're at the eighth chapter. To refresh your memory, it says <clears throat> that the seven angels who stand before the throne of God who were given seven trumpets. Again, these are the final things, the number seven uh, implying that it's the time for the wrapping up of things. And um, the seven trumpets are seven announcements. These are the sayings of God spoken into the earth that shake not only the heavens but also the earth in that they bring forth the things that God always intended to put into the earth and they announce the coming forth of them in the appointed seasons. That being said, the heavens and the earth would be shaken and the things God means to bring in will shift and change the entire trajectory of the present form of human enterprise and endeavor to accommodate the things that God is doing. Now, he goes on to say, then another angel was given a golden censer, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the, along with the prayers of the saints uh, upon the golden altar which stood before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings and an earthquake. Now to properly understand this symbolism here in uh, the eighth chapter, we must go back and take a look at the replica of the golden altar of incense that was once placed in the earth and placed in the tabernacle that Moses was instructed to build in the wilderness. It's fascinating the sequence of things as God was structuring how His presence would be honored amongst the people when He enacted the covenantal order of the law of Moses. In Exodus, beginning with Exodus 20, actually beginning with Exodus 19, God tells Moses that He's about to invite the people of Israel to come up into a covenantal relationship with God. In Ezekiel 19, the instruction, rather in, in, in Exodus 19, the instruction God gives Moses is to say to the people, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Go and say this to Israel. Now, they ran from the presence of God and would not come into that covenant. So, the order of, uh, of the order, the order of Levi and the law of Moses was given, and the scriptures are plain on the subject. They were given until the seed should come. Now, God knew ahead of time Israel would not enter into uh, the invitation of God to become part of a royal priesthood, kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So He gave them that which is, was a type and shadow. Now as He's establishing this type and shadow, He's putting into it things that relate to this offering to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation that, they, that He knew they were going to reject. But God remains undeterred from what He means to do. Even when men turn away, in the midst of their turning away, He installs things that would be prominent and prophetic symbols so that when they come back, those things being resurrected would, would in a sense show that even though they departed from God, 
God never changed what he intended to give. So when, men, when, when Israel departed then from the promise of being a royal priesthood and a holy nation, God began by giving them the law and then He proceeded to tell them how to understand the law amongst themselves. So He reset their culture. Their culture until now was that of Egyptian culture, the mindset of slavery. So He gives them the template of the law, the Ten Commandments and the 310, uh, 311 uh, laws in the book of the law. Right? That was designed to recreate an identity away from slavery to the restoration of the promise that would shape and determine how they would function as a people. Following that, God then began to describe how His presence would come in amongst them. And so he described uh, the, uh, the forms of worship or the forms that he would inhabit, which by themselves are types and shadows of heavenly things. They would include uh, instructions about making the Ark of the Covenant central to uh, how he would relate to them, how His presence would come and dwell amongst them, uh, how they would be re- what they would be required to do to construct the tabernacle, the housing of His presence. So first the Ark of the Covenant and then the structure that would house His presence. And then the other things that relate to how they would approach His presence within His house. All these things speak, of course, of the body of Christ, how we would approach God by being reconciled to God in Christ, how we would become a new creation and so on. And I don't have time here to go into the, what, what, what were the things put in the Ark of the Covenant. Then he would instruct such things as the making of the menorah, the seven branch candelabra, which would indicate how his presence would bring light to the understandings of the people. And then he would talk about how they would make a golden altar for the burning of incense. And that's really the point to which we have come in this discussion when in in the book of Revelation, the eighth chapter, in heaven the, the archetype, the reality is presented against the background of the type and shadow that was initially put as God was forming a people who were type and shadow of a holy people to come, namely the body of Christ to come at the end of the age. So you see this movement through history. So it benefits us now to go back and to look at the, this altar from which the angel took Uh, fire. We'll talk about the angel himself but I'm, I'm wanting to set up the understanding of what's going on. The Ark of the Covenant, or rather this altar, this golden altar of incense was placed before the Ark of the Covenant. If the Ark of the Covenant is indicative of the presence of God, where where God's presence dwelt, the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God dwelt among the Israelites in the wilderness. The altar, this is not the bronze altar for the offering of sacrifices, of animal sacrifices. This that was set outside of the Holy of Holies, outside of the tabernacle. Jesus would be crucified outside of the city but I don't have time to go into that. This is the golden altar of incense and it's set before the presence of God. Why? And Aaron is given this instruction that in the morning he should burn sweet incense every morning 
while he's lighting the lamps, uh, he should, uh, he, when he tends the lamps, he should burn incense on this altar. And in the evening, he should burn incense on the altar. So that this, this incense represented the perpetual prayers of the saints going, going up to God. Now the fire that, that was put upon this censer uh, on which incense was put, uh, the, the fire came from the altar of burnt offerings. We would see that earlier on. And God said this strange thing uh, in verse 9 of Exodus 30 that has the reference to the building, the instructions for the building of the golden altar of incense. He said, You shall not offer strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, or a drink offering. Why shouldn't they? Because this was a unique representation. It was meant to represent, if you like, the prayers of the saints. I want to read from the book of Leviticus, the 10th chapter, an unusual happening. And it concerned the two sons of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, were given the responsibility to place fire from the altar of burned burned offerings, sacrifices, to place fire from that on the censer, which would contain the incense, to take it into the golden altar where the incense would be burned before God representing, of course, the prayers of the saints. Here is the story. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered profane fire from the, before the Lord which He had not commanded them. So they got fire from their cook fires. They were going to they were going to save themselves the time to stop by the altar of burnt offerings to get fire from there, from the sacrificial fires, and they were going to save themselves one extra trip, one extra stop on their way to the golden altar. So they got fire from their cook fires, from their own domestic pleasure. And they brought that, they put that fire on the censer with the incense and brought it in to offer the incense before God. And fire went out and devoured them and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I shall be glorified." God had extremely strict instructions for those who represented Him to the people. He will not permit as prayers whatever we want. So this whole folly of attempting to make God into Santa Claus by presenting to God our wish list, not the prayers that come from hearts of sacrifice, but the prayers that come from the hearts of convenience, prayers that emanate from our lust, from our desires, are strange fire, 
strange offerings before God. I have much to say about that, but not now. Part of that which is being judged in the present order of things is this strange fire, the offerings of profane things to the Lord in exchange for goods and services. So we've been told that what pleases God are sacrifices of money. But the scriptures make it very plain that the sacrifice that is acceptable, which may be demonstrated by money, but not money itself, is the sacrifice of our being. The widow with the two mites did in fact sacrifice money, but what was behind the sacrifice? What was said by Jesus concerning her? That she had first given herself, because the two mites represented the extent of all the wealth she possessed. So it is said by Paul when he was praising the the believers in Macedonia that they gave generously of their means and beyond, but they first gave themselves. Now, by the time you come to this altar in heaven, this is the reality, the type and shadow of which is what we just read about in the 30th chapter of Exodus and in the 10th chapter of Leviticus. I read that to you to show God's attitude toward profane, what He views as profane prayers, prayers of convenience, prayers that would have us remain unsacrificed before God. So much so that Romans, the, uh, the twelfth chapter says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable sacrifice. And do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove that which is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Prayers that come from an untransformed mind are prayers about your physical, financial, and other forms of natural well being. It is not inappropriate to ask God for those things, but they must come out of this heart of a sacrificed life. And then your prayers are exactly as He would have you pray. This this goes back to the issue of faith, the word pistis. Pistis is where we get the term epistemology. It means what you stand on, what is foundational to you, what is the conviction upon which your life stands. So, this other angel has a golden censer and comes before the altar where the prayers of the saints have come up for a memorial before God. And I use that term to, to reference the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, that has to do with a statement made to Cornelius because the angel said to Cornelius, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God, because Cornelius was first and foremost a righteous man. Do not be surprised in these times when we are seeing the prayers of the unrighteous being rejected by God, even as the unrighteous themselves are being thrown out of the temple of God as money changers. So, 
how much he, this angel was given much incense that he should offer it, and incense of course was sweet smelling, I don't have time to unpack what the incense was comprised of, um, but part of it was frankincense, um, and I, I believe a mixture with myrrh, which have to do, which were the things, some of the things presented to Christ um, at his birth, uh, signifying the offering of his uh, indestructible life. Uh, they were gifts not only fit for a king, but fit for the living God who had come as that sacrifice. And so his life was the sacrifice, and the gifts typified what that sacrifice was meant to be. And we who follow in, in his steps are meant to be sacrificed as well. So out of this sacrificial life then, the prayers of the saints are mixed with the, the symbols of sacrifice which are the, the ingredients of the incense, placed upon fire taken from the altar of sacrifice. On earth they were depicted on the altar of incense, in heaven it references this altar, which may or may not be an actual altar, but a condition of the saints and we saw before that the saints were under the altar uh, and, and they were the ones who were beheaded for the witness of Christ. So the concept of sacrifice and the prayers of the saints and the golden altar all merge into this one picture in heaven. Now uh, I want to comment briefly on the, the angel who had the altar, who had the, uh, the censer, who mixed the prayers of the saints with incense upon the altar and was given much incense. Let me remind you, in fact, let me go back to and bring this forward about the, the ordering of the book of Revelation. What, what is it? Let's go back to chapter 1 and we'll read verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave Him to show His servants things which must shortly take place, and He sent and signified it by His angel to His servant John." Now what am I saying? Here you have this angel with the, the golden censer with the prayers of the saints on it, which he's about to hurl into the earth. And when it's hurled into the earth, it becomes the fulfillment to the prayers of the saints. And that brings judgment upon the earth. This is the role that Christ Himself was given. See, as, you, as I read you the first verse of the book of Revelation, and what do we have? We have a revelation that God gave to the Lamb, because in His capacity as the Lamb, it's the Lamb who's opening the seals, while He was on the earth He did not know that even the time of His own return, no man knows the day nor the hour, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but the Father only, Revelation to, uh, uh, Matthew 24. But now, now the book of Revelation begins 
And this was given uh, in, in, in approximately the year 85 AD and Jesus had died by 33 AD, more or less. So you've got 42 years difference. Jesus is already back in heaven when John is invited to come up and now he knows, Jesus knows the time of his own return. The Lamb now knows because he's been given the revelation that he didn't have while he was on the earth. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him and he makes it known to John who is writing these things, how? by sending his angel. The role that this angel has is uniquely the role that Jesus has because this angel with the prayers of the saints is in a role of the mediator and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is the one who hears our prayers, he is the one who brings our offerings of praise and prayers before the Father. He is that mediator. He assigns the role to this angel just like he said he would and he does that at the point of the opening of the seventh seal. What does that mean? It means Jesus is behind all of this the power that's moving everything forward to the conclusion is the power that was given to the Lamb, to the Lamb. It's the Lamb who is opening the seals. It's the Lamb who is authorizing all of what is to happen. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, an abundant demonstration that the prayers of the saints which have been collected up, which have been held in trust, waiting for the appropriate time, the prayers are being revealed as answered upon the earth and when they do, there are noises, thunderings, lightnings and a great earthquake. All that Christ has meant to do, all that He showed the church to be and to do, He's about to do now, even as the seven angels prepare to sound their trumpets. I'm Sam Solon, we'll continue this discussion. See you then, bye-bye.